Hi here, Phil here. I believe that the best way to learn how to code is to code. F*** theory, make stuff and learn as you go. Even if you're an absolute beginner, you can already start building stuff. And after this tutorial, you'll already be able to start using JavaScript in your own project. We will build a fully working to-do list web app, where users will be able to add, complete and delete tasks. And then we will create a completely outrageous and absurd CSS word without writing any CSS. After which we'll make a regular household possum to... <coughs> Sorry, that's... Uh... So let's go. I'm using the Visual Studio Code code editor in this tutorial, and you should too. The link is in the description. It's free, quick and painless like dying from a giant baobab tree falling on you. First, the folder structure. The main folder of this project, called the root folder, invented by Sir Gaddafi Turney Prutabaga in 1802, hence the name. In it, index.html, the home page. It's always called index.html. You can't change its name. It's not your regular demented grandmother. That's how a browser knows what file of your website to load first. Three folders, CSS, scripts, icons. In them are empty files we'll need for this project. Be organized, not paralyzed. Index.html. Fuck this file, let's get over with it quickly. Shift 1, Enter gives you the basic structure of the HTML. Title Jean Claude Van Damme. You can name your app anything you like. I like Jean Claude Van Damme. We will only need three DOM elements text area to type your tasks into unordered list to display all the tasks and an HTML comment element containing the text you're so amazing to flatter ourselves. CSS is linked to the HTML in the head. JavaScript is linked in the same way, except it isn't. CSS is like a thought of a woman, always in the head. JavaScript, however, is like a thought of a man, very rarely in the head and almost always in the end of the body. <coughs> But unlike with the man, it's really where it needs to be. That way, the browser runs it only after loading all of the content of your page, which prevents slowing down the loading of your page, very important for SEO and the happiness and the mental well-being of your visitors. It doesn't matter much for our small Jean-Claude here, but it matters a lot for projects that are big, like Jean-Claude's mother. <clears throat> okay, done with the HTML, let's move on to JS. There are seven basic concepts after learning which you'll be able to start coding anything you want. The concepts are in no particular order. Variables, methods, functions, events, conditional statements, loops and how to swear extensively. We will cover number one to five in this part of the tutorial. Number six loops we will cover in the second part of this tutorial. And number seven most of you should have mastered pretty well already. Number one, JavaScript variables and malaria. If you know what variables are already, you can safely skip to the next chapter in the playhead. In programming, like in math, a variable is a container that contains things. It can contain a string, a number, a collection of strings, numbers or strings and numbers mixed together, more on that later, or objects, more on that later too. Creating a variable is called declaring it. To do it, you use the keyword followed by the name of a variable. Let first name Malaria Lenin, let age 65. Const birthplace USSR, var intentions unclear. When we use the keyword let or var, the contents of our variable can be changed later in the code. Age 66, malaria just turned 66. But uh, when we use the keyword const, it means the contents of our variable cannot be changed later in the code. Const birthplace USSR. Nothing malaria does in her life will change the place of her birth. After we've declared the variable, we don't need this keyboard anymore and we'll use it in our code without it. Name equals Malaria Gonzalez. Malaria just married Jose Eleuterio Gonzalez, a famous Mexican physician and philanthropist, and became Malaria Gonzalez. Let's create a variable called task input. Number two, JavaScript methods and charlatans. So, our variable task input, which we've created for our app, will contain a reference to that text input field we have just created in the index.html. Using this variable, we'll be able to take full control of that text input from JavaScript. Because this variable will always refer to this HTML element, we don't want to change it by mistake. That's why this variable is const. Document is a JavaScript object that represents your web page. 
For now, let's just remember that a JavaScript object is like a special kind of a variable that can have a lot of very different things in it. You can create your own objects and JavaScript also has a lot of built-in objects you can use, like in this case, a document, an object that has a shitloads of things in it that lets you control your web page. And JavaScript objects are like charlatan dentists, because every JavaScript object has its own methods. And methods are basically functions that these objects can perform. Here is a quick Vietnamese flashback, where another Philip, who is also me, will explain how methods work in one second. You can skip it in the playhead chapters, if Vietnam is not your thing. Methods of the objects are basically functions that these objects can perform. For example, the real world methods of the real world objects might look something like this. Woman, walk, woman, go into house, woman, cook, cement truck, drive, cement truck, mix concrete, woman, drive, woman, mix concrete. And when you put stuff into braces, that is called passing a parameter to a function. Sometimes you are required to put stuff into braces, like for example, cement track, turn left. It wouldn't know where to turn otherwise. Sometimes it's not necessary, you can just tell a woman to cook something. And sometimes there is no need for it at all, like cement truck, mix concrete. So, the document object has a method called query selector, which allows you to access any HTML element with JavaScript. As a parameter, it takes any CSS selector, surrounded by the quotes. In this case, it's an ID of an HTML element, task input. In CSS, hashtag refers to an ID of an element. You should already know that one, just in case. Now let's create another variable and assign another HTML element to it. The unordered list that will display all the added tasks. Now that we have access to the text field where a user will enter tasks, let's actually get the text the user will be typing into that field and create a task with this text every time a user presses enter. How do we do that? Query selector method returns an HTML element. That HTML element is also a JavaScript object, which means our variable is now a JavaScript object representing our text input. And every JavaScript object has methods like charlatan dentists, remember? And these methods allow you to access and control any HTML elements on the page. Number three, JavaScript events and Walt Disney. One of the methods of the element object is called add event listener. It allows detecting events on the page, like keys being pressed, mouse moves, mouse clicks, Mickey Mouse, no, sorry, not that. Sound. <clears throat> so we need to detect keyboard keys being pressed. Add event listener takes two parameters, the name of the event we're interested in, key down, and the function we want to run when this event is detected, on task input key down. And on task input key down is the name of a function we will now create. It doesn't exist yet. We can name this function anything we like. For example, Jean-Claude spread legs between trucks. But it's always good to name things discreetly. That's why I went for on task input key down instead. Number four, JavaScript functions and inflating the cashier lady. In JavaScript, functions are chunks of code. Just like methods, they do things, but they are not attached to any specific objects. They are basically on their own. And if declaring a variable starts with the keyword const, let or var, declaring a function starts with the word function. <clears throat> the inventor of this keyword got an international prize for originality in 1995 in Beijing. <clears throat> the second thing that differs a JavaScript function from a JavaScript variable is that a JavaScript function is basically like a victim of that notorious charlatan dentist. Whenever you see it, it always has two braces. And sometimes it has four, two of which are curly. And when you declare a function, all the code of a function goes inside curly braces. Finishing with a semicolon. In JavaScript, semicolon acts like a dot in a sentence. Every statement in JavaScript should end with a semicolon. Now, if we put stuff inside this function, it will run every time a user types something in the text field. <clears throat> but we only need to add a task when the enter key is pressed. So how do we do that? Just like method, a function can take parameters. They go into round braces. When you declare a function, you can declare these parameters too. Event is a parameter. Parameters are basically variables that will represent any stuff you give to a function when you run it. Here is a quick nightmarish example. The function inflate the cashier lady. It takes parameters PSI and guest type. 
The function runs different methods of different objects associated with the pump that will be used to inflate the cashier lady. <clears throat> Inside this function you can see how guest type is used by fill with method of a pump tank object and PSI is used by the set PSI method of a pump gouge object. And to make the function run you call it just like this and pass whichever parameters to it you want. So how do we know which keys is user pressing in our text field? Sorcery. Because we put on task input key down inside add event listener here, any parameter that we now add to this on task input key down function will contain all of the information about that key down event. For obvious reasons, people usually name this parameter event, but it could be named anything. And it will still contain all the information about the event that is firing. Function on task input key down Galina console log Galina key code. If I tell you how exactly this happens, I will have to kill you. So let's move on. The log method of the console object helps us log the property key code of the event object to a browser console. And now in a brief Vietnamese flashback, another Philip, who is also me, will explain what console is in a few seconds. If you know this already, you can skip this. Console is a JavaScript object that gives you access to the browser console. And the browser console is something that would make you feel like you're a hacker. But generally, it's just used by developers to debug stuff, see the errors and log stuff to it. To open the developer console in Google Chrome, you just go to the three dots menu, go to more tools and then go to developer tools. Optionally, you can just right click and click inspect, but that would open the HTML. So you'd need to switch to the console here. So the log method of the console object helps us log the key code of the event object to a browser console. Why isn't key code followed by braces? It's a method, right? Or wrong. Apart from methods, objects have one other thing, properties. If methods are like functions, properties are like variables. They don't do anything, they just contain things. For example, Grandpa, sit, grandpa, stand, grandpa, sit, grandpa, heal, grandpa, attack, grandpa, age, grandpa, wait. So the object event has a property key code. And now we know that the enter key has the key code 13. The person who assigned this key code to the enter initially was trying to enter hell. <clears throat> But still, how do you make the script do something only when the key code equals 13? Number 5. Conditional statements and hiccups. Conditional statements are used to perform different actions based on different conditions. There are four conditional statements in JavaScript. If, else, else, if, and switch. Right now, we'll just require a simple if statement. But we will need the other ones in the part 2 of this tutorial. An if statement looks like a function. If event.keycode equals 13. But instead of parameters, it takes a condition and braces. And if this condition is true, the code inside the curly braces is run. And if not, it's ignored. But wait, why is this equal sign double? I had hiccups when I was typing it. You should never attempt swallowing a chicken egg in its entirety. Uh, no, the single equal sign is only used to assign values to variables. It's called the assignment operator. Const Vladimir equals fantastic moron. This is the assignment. It was assigned to Vladimir during his birth. And the double equals sign is used to check if one thing is equal to another. It's called a comparison operator. Vladimir equals equals fantastic moron. This is a statement and it is true. Vladimir equals equals pony. This is also a statement and it is false. And there are other comparison operators in JavaScript. Not equal greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to. So function on task input key down event, if event dot key code equals equals 13, window alert don't press enter, you bastard. And now our task input key down function that runs on the key down event has an if statement inside it with the code that only runs when a visitor presses enter. But instead of harassing visitors, it needs to help them add tasks. So let's make it do that. Or should we? We've learned a lot now, so we can move quicker. Let's get the text that the user will be typing in the text field first. 
That's it. Value property contains the value of an HTML input element. We'll put it in a task text variable. In a second, we will write a separate function called addTask that will be responsible for adding tasks. This function does not exist yet. This function will run inside our if statement, like so. When you write it like that, it's called calling a function. You make it run. And our addTask function will accept a single parameter, the value of the text field. Because the thing is, when we declare variables inside if statements or other functions, they are only accessible inside those if statements or other functions. This is called a scope of a variable. So our task text variable is only accessible inside this if statement. The rest of the code does not know about it. For instance, the variables task input and task list are accessible everywhere because we've declared it outside of any functions or other blocks of code. And also we've declared them on the very top. This also matters as the code is read by the browser from the top to bottom. So, because task text is only accessible inside this if statement and the add task function need to access it, we need to pass task text to the add task as a parameter. Add task, task text. Now let's write the add task function itself because we are trying to run it here but it doesn't yet exist. And unlike variable declarations, the position of a function from the top does not matter. It can be declared anywhere on the page and it will still be accessible from everywhere in the code. But exactly the same as variables, the declaration of a function should not be inside another function or a block of code if we want it to be accessible from anywhere in the code. So let's finally declare the addTask function. We will name the function addTask and it will accept a single parameter that will name text. I also won those prizes for originality. And when our addTask function runs inside that if statement above, this text parameter will contain the value of our text input field. Because when we run this function there, we pass the value of our text input field as a parameter. First, our function will create a Lee HTML element that will go inside our unordered list here. We've created a Lee element with createElement method and we put it inside a task item variable. Now, task item is a Lee element. Did you know, by the way, that the Lee element was invented by the famous Chinese inventor Li Jing Su back in 1305 BC? Hence the name. Now let's take the text that the user typed before she hit enter and put this text inside this Li element. Task item dot inner HTML equals text. But if we try to run it, it wouldn't work. We would not see anything. Why is that? Well, when we created the Lee element, we just created it. Basically, just told the browser that it exists. But we did not tell it where. So, just like a country, Nauru, it exists, but nobody knows where. We need to tell the browser where to put it. Remember, we've created the task list variable in the very beginning. This is where it needs to go. And the way we do it is very simple. Task list, append child, task item. Our function now makes sense. It creates an HTML element, puts it inside the variable called task item, takes the input text that was passed to the function in the on task input key down function, puts this text inside the Lee element, and puts this element inside the unsorted list of elements on the page. Now, every time a user types something in the text field and hits enter, this text will be added to HTML, wrapped in a Lee element. Our to-do list app is complete. Thank you very much for watching, like it if you liked it, hit the bell, subscribe and see you soon. <coughs> no, just a couple of small things. Users need to be able to tick off tasks and remove them and I also promised the outrageous CSS that will add without writing any single line of CSS in just one click of a button. So let's continue our humble endeavor. Let's remove this nonsense. First, let's create a checkbox element that will be used to tick off tasks. At the moment, task checkbox is just an input, and to become a checkbox, its HTML type property needs to be set to checkbox. This is what it needs to look like when JavaScript adds it to the HTML. So let's set its type. Now let's create a checkbox label where the text will go. That way, when a user clicks on a label, the checkbox will also be checked or unchecked. However, there is a problem. We know from HTML that to make a label relate to a specific checkbox, the label needs to have the for attribute containing the ID of that specific checkbox. 
Otherwise, clicking on the label would not tick the checkbox. So every new task checkbox that will be created by JavaScript needs to have its own ID. And every label of that checkbox needs to have the for attribute containing that ID. So how do we do that? It's actually very simple. First, let's create a variable that will contain a number. This number will be equal to the number of tasks that are currently added. The getElementsByTagName method gets all the elements in the document that match a specific tag name. In that case, it's a Lee. And the length attribute returns the total quantity of all these elements. And since the addTask function adds a new task every time it runs, the number of tasks will also be different every time this function runs. So our variable number of tasks will contain a unique number on every task creation. Actually, I realized that this is complete bullshit. It's a very bad way to get a unique number. And you will see why when you try to add functionality to delete tasks. But actually, see if you can spot what the problem is yourself and maybe fix it. If you can't, I will tell you how to do it in the next video. So now let's create a string that we can use to set both the ID of the task checkbox and the for attribute of its label. Here we declare a variable task ID and make it to be equal to a combination of a string and that unique number we just got from the total number of tasks. The plus sign is called an assignment operator and like in math it's used to add things together. Unlike many other programming languages, JavaScript allows you to combine numbers with text strings and will just treat the number as the text in that case. So if the number of tasks is equal to say 1, the result of this combination will be a string task1. And now we can use this task ID variable to set both the ID of a checkbox and the for attribute of its label. As you can see, uh, on example of HTML4 property, object properties names don't always match HTML element attributes, so it's always best to Google them. Now we've created a checkbox in this label and set their attributes. Let's add them to the HTML. If we do not do it, nobody knows where it exists, remember? And I also successfully forgot to set the task label value here and task label text. Great, now users can add tasks and actually complete them. The only inconvenience is that after you add a task, you need to manually erase it from the text field to write a new one. This is not nice, but this can be fixed with just one line of code. And you can already do it, based on what you already know so far. Pause the video now and see if you can guess it for a rare chance to win a semi-automatic motorized antelope impregnator. The offer only applies to those temporarily incapacitated by a sea otter during the festive days of Jewish Hanukkah while sitting on a motorcycle sidecar dressed in the costume of wild goose and holding the name Jessica or Gertrude. So have you guessed it? Here is how we do it. All we need to do is set the value of our text input to an empty string after each task has been created. And the final thing remaining to do in this part of the tutorial, before we can write the insane CSS for it, is to add the ability for users to remove tasks. And this will be your homework. In my experience, the best way to learn how to code is to try and build something yourself, something that you need, without following any stupid YouTube tutorials. And just Google things whenever you need. But also, in this video we've covered everything that you would need to be able to add this functionality. You would probably just need to google one method of an HTML element. For now, let's just add the not working remove button to each task so that we have more elements to style. That's it. No more learning for today. The fun part now. The fun part and the middle-aged librarian woman from Yakutsk. This whole thing looks so boring. The middle-aged librarian woman in a small public library in Yakutsk could probably die from boredom while using this app for her humble shopping list of two vegetables. We need to style it and we need it to look fun. But we don't have time and also I'm lazy. Luckily, there is a way we can do it without writing any CSS. We can do it by using AI, ChatGPT to be specific. If you're not familiar with it, ChatGPT is an AI language model that can write almost any text you ask it to write. In this case, I want to take our JavaScript, feed it to ChatGPT and ask it to write CSS for the HTML this JavaScript is generating. Because CSS is also just text. So we go to ChatGPT, create an account if you don't have one already and write a prompt followed by our JavaScript code. And you can be creative with a prompt, but here's what I wrote. 
Write CSS for the HTML that the following JavaScript generates. Make it the most surreal and absurdly looking CSS possible. So what I got was this. And then I thought, I'd run it again. And I got this. And then I thought, I'd run it again. And I got this. And then I couldn't stop. So I got this. And then I got this. And then I got this. In the part 2 of this tutorial, we will finish learning essential concepts of JavaScript. There are not that many of them left. Add functionality to remove tasks. Add functionality to save tasks without any server-side coding for servers. Host our app for free and very quickly. Turn our web app into a mobile app with just one tap. And most importantly, fuck up our app completely by adding a very bizarre and surreal idea to it that would set it apart from other to-do list apps out there. So click here for the part 2 of this tutorial. If it's not there yet, don't click there. It's not there yet. I will make it next week. Thank you very much for watching, like it if you liked it, subscribe, hit the bell to stop illegal trafficking of church bells to North Korea and see you soon.